G'day and welcome to another episode of the Everything Antarctica podcast. I'm your host, Maddie Jordan. I'm joined again by my co-host, Johnny Harrison. And today we've got a very special guest in the room. We're speaking to Louis Chilcott, who is a guide at the International Antarctic Centre in Christchurch and an Antarctic enthusiast. Thanks for joining us, Louis. Thanks, Maddie. It's great to have you here. Thanks. Um, Tell us a little bit about your background. I'm sensing an Australian accent there, so... Yeah, uh, definitely an Australian accent. um, An affront to all the Kiwis, both in the room and outside of the room. But um, (laughs) my my background is, uh, I could say, I've always had uh, an interest in wildlife, an interest in nature, interest in the environment. So Australian, Steve Irwin, David Attenborough, there's a lot of connections that you can draw there. about 2010 or so I first started hearing about a specific animal called a leopard seal. Leopard seals uh, to anyone that doesn't know it's a predator, not you could argue apex predator um, in the Antarctic loves to eat uh, crab eater seals, penguins, quirrell basically anything it can get its teeth around and swallow Uh, and they've got a pretty bad reputation because they love to eat penguins. Everyone thinks penguins are cute and adorable. (laughs) Uh, No one ever wants anything bad to ever happen to them. If you watch Happy Feet, there's a a pretty villainous leopard seal in there. So they've got this bad reputation. And in the early 2000s, there was, unfortunately, a a British scientist that was killed um, by a leopard seal. And so right around that uh, time, there's pretty bad reputation for these animals. And a photographer by the name of Paul Nicklin goes down to the Antarctic to try to see what these animals are like, see if they deserve this reputation or not. And so he goes down there and sees this absolutely massive um, female leopard seal, females larger than the males, and is really, really getting scared. I'm not getting in the water with that thing. Well, come (laughs) on, mate. You came all the way down here. Get in the water. And so he dives in the water with this female leopard seal She's coming up, she's giving him these very threatening uh, thrusts with her mouth and her neck, and it's looking quite intimidating and quite scary. She stops that after a few minutes and then goes off and swims off and grabs a penguin and swims back and gives him the penguin, lets it go. Penguin swims off. She swims off again, goes and grabs the penguin again, brings it back, opens it up. Penguin swims off. She goes after it again, kills it, brings it back to him, lets it go. He's just sitting there taking photos the whole time. And now you've got one dead penguin just floating in the water. So she goes off again, kills another penguin, brings it back to him. He's got another dead penguin just floating in the water. And this happens over the, over the course of multiple days. And eventually he tries to put together what the hell is happening. I think that this apex predator solitary hunter that we had given a very bad reputation to is trying to feed me. And that was a story that really, really attached me to these animals. And when you start to learn about leopard seals, you start to learn about penguins, you start to learn about the Antarctic. And so that kind of started the ball rolling. And then, of course, everything um, really, really properly started when I got to go to the ice in 2014. Cool. Before we touch on that, I think this is just such a fascinating way to get into Antarctica. And Johnny and I are both pretty avid photographers, so we've seen the images that Paul Nicklin has taken of this um, leopard seal and the penguin. But most people, I think, would develop a fascination with Antarctica around the penguins, around potentially the whales and the orcas or, you know, a a snow petrel or something like that. Something pretty, something that looks nice, something that's majestic, something that we can kind of relate to. But a leopard seal being an apex predator like that is a very unusual way to become interested in Antarctica and I love that story I think that is so cool Uh, it's apex predators to me um, again very heavy Steve Irwin influence Uh, sharks crocodiles things that we don't uh, always necessarily think of as pretty Um, reptiles in general is still a massive interest of mine so things that other people don't find as attractive has also been uh, a large interest to me so the fact that we do have a mammalian people are typically more attracted to mammalian things but in this particular case we kind of stay away from it and shy away from it um 
that we still know so, so little about uh, just because of their habitat, their range, so much wildlife in the Antarctic, so much about Antarctica itself. We're still just grasping the edges of uh, what there is to know. And uh, to me, a very charismatic animal, there's a very popular term of charismatic megafauna, and I'd argue that it fits that category. But again, as I've said, it's just people don't like it because it kills the cute things. And I say to uh, a lot of the people that come on my tours at the Antarctic Centre, okay, uh, why don't people feel bad about gazelles? They get killed by lions all the time. Why don't people feel bad for seals when they get killed by polar bears? There's certain animals that we know that they're predators and they uh, kill other things in order to survive, but we don't think poorly of them for whatever reason. And so I guess my fascination with these kind of animals is just what why is there that difference um what what lines in our own minds are we drawing um and i just find that interesting i love that and it's even with orca as well right the killer whales people are fascinated by them they love them but they are brutal in the water yeah yeah Yeah. they they can be both nature doesn't have to just be one thing it can be um Beautiful, just like that story with Paul Nicklin, and you still acknowledge that um, there's some absolutely brutal photos out there of leopard seals um, killing penguins, shaking them to death. There's really, really grisly photos out there, and they can be both. Um, they're this animal that I feel very, very passionately for, but I'm never going to deny that they're an apex predator which kills in order to survive. I love that. It's so good, isn't it? I love it. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it's interesting to sort of you, you make mention around the penguins and it, I guess from a, you know, purely based on land species, we sort of, or predominantly more so, um, we can do a lot more research around penguins and things like that. Yes. So <clears throat> for seals and, and orca and, and all these things, you know, you, you sort of talk about the amount that we don't know mm-hmm. and it is so great. And I, I wonder if part of that is down to um, purely the fact that when we when we can even get to Antarctica, we can see these penguins, they're right there on the land with us. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of like the... the the distances that you have to go and, and the distances that even these these mammals go is just phenomenal, right? So it's um it's quite something else, but it's so cool that yeah, you've got such a, an amazing passion for it. It's so good. Yeah. Um just animals that we don't understand well, I guess you could say. Yeah. I love it. That's a very Steve Irwin mentality to things and mm. I mean I grew up yeah, spent a bit of time in Brisbane as well, so got to head out to to his zoo. Aussie and, Zoo, yeah. Yeah, go and see some of the animals there. And I've actually got a photo, I must have been about five or six at the time, of um, of him and I. So he's, oh, awesome. He's a, um, awesome. Yeah, he had a big influence on my life as well, I think, just an appreciation for wildlife and the desire to protect the planet. So that is actually something that I haven't thought about until right now, but that probably had quite a big influence on me as a child. So Yeah. And um, we might touch on it a little bit later on, but these influences, these stories almost in a sense um i think we don't properly give consideration to how important they are um until you actually do start thinking about them and think okay yeah i am a bit like that where did that come from oh it was probably traced to all the way back here as as a child or as you're developing but yeah amazing how good okay so you've got this fascination with leopard seals and that drove you towards visiting antarctica to go and see them for yourself so tell us about that and what was that like so fast forward 2010 to 2014 and uh, I, I say this um, every time someone at the Antarctic Centre asks me, have you been to the Antarctic? Uh, I'll say yes. And then the next words will be, I've been very lucky. And I maintain that every single time that I say it because that is honestly the truth. Um, I was given a very fortunate opportunity to be able to go down um, as a high school student in 2014, uh, traveling all the way from Brisbane to uh, Dubai, Dubai to South America, and then from the bottom of South America, a little town called Ushuaia, which a lot of people use as their launching point uh, on a tourist expedition to go from the bottom of South America to the Antarctic Peninsula, the closest point from a, any other continent to Antarctica. I love that you p- follow up, yes, I've been to Antarctica with I'm so lucky. And for us particularly, I mean, we know 
how special the place is. We know how lucky we, we are to be there, but I don't think that's something that comes up in conversation very often, not for me anyway. I talk about how grateful I am to have had the opportunity to go, and I talk about how much I love my work and what I do, but when people ask, yeah, it's that, that sense of gratitude, I think that's so cool, and that will have such a big impact on people when they're talking to you at the Antarctic Centre, because I see that passion shine through. And uh, I'd actually be curious to uh, ask you two a, a question about this now because uh, so many people, um, when they go down, uh, there's a longing to return. And I've, I've been searching for 10 years now to try to find a set of words um, that could possibly describe why. And this is going back and reading uh, historical accounts, talking to people that have gone down recently, reading as much as I can from both. And I only came up with something uh, probably about three weeks ago. Someone uh, on one of my tour groups said, there's a word called ineffable, and it means an experience that can't be described with words. And that's the only thing I've come up with so far that even touches on it. In- ineffable is a perfect summary. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, there's, to me, as I've been thinking about it and trying to describe it, you can use... Majest- like to describe Antarctica, you can say it's majestic, you can say it's magnificent, you can say it makes you feel humble, it makes you feel small, you're isolated. There's, there's all these pretty words. But every time someone describes it that way, I think I've heard a rainforest described that way. I've heard a desert, a hot desert described that way. I've heard all these different landscapes ar- described that way. Now, I'm not uh, the most well-traveled person in the world, but I've talked to a lot of people that are, and they will say the Antarctic is that and there's something more. There's something more that you don't seem to get in these other places, these other areas, and I don't know exactly what that is. So if you two could try to expand on that, I'd love to know. It's a very special feeling, and I've I've actually felt it in two places. So Antarctica was one, and the other one was the Galapagos Islands. Mm And again, that's probably drawing to my love of wildlife and childhood and things like that. But it is, I mean, you can't describe it, right? It's very difficult to portray what that feeling is like to someone who hasn't been there because it is a feeling. Yes. It's very hard to describe. And I I talk to my partner quite often about this and she's just like, I just don't get the, I don't get the fascination with Antarctica. Like, why are you so crazy about it? And... I, I just can't explain it. Like, there aren't words, really, and I find it really challenging to to try and talk to someone about that. And, I mean, you can you can describe the physical landscape in adjectives and there's beautiful, glorious, large mountains and incredible white, orange, yellow, green, blue colours and magnificent animals and wildlife and things like that, but it doesn't really do it justice. Like, people can't picture that. They can't no, see it, you no. know, so... Yeah, that is a very challenging question. I'm going to have to ponder on that for a little while. I think the way that I try and describe it to people is that um, (coughs) there's very few places in the world that you can go that you have the option to go um, whenever you like. And Antarctica is not necessarily one of those places. And so Mm -hmm. for me and a lot of, you know, particularly working down there, you never know if you're ever going to get back. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing that sticks with me is that... Um, it might not be up to you as to whether or not you even get the chance to go back. And I think that's why it holds such a, a special place because it is it is that uh, thing that even even your best endeavours might might still uh, fail to, to meet that, that goal or that expectation. So so to me that's the, the difference and, and while it's not, you know, <laughs> definitely not one word or, yeah, yeah, or, or yeah. coming at it from that, um, I think that kind of at least... Uh, helps people understand. Okay, yes, there's there's more to it than just, um, you know. Oh, cool! I want to I want to go here for a holiday. It's like it's it's not really that actually. It's you know, <laughs> this place holds holds something special and 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 in a place in your heart, right? Yeah, I think the more I talk about it, the more I realise I don't know about the place, and that for me is really fascinating. So there's so many different components from wildlife to history to the physical landscapes to science to research and the more you talk about it I mean I've learnt something already right mm. just just talking about leopard seals I've, it's changed my perspective on how I think about them and look at them and 
there's always something that you can take from having these conversations with people, which is exactly why we're doing this, because we want to capture the stories and we want to hear people's different perspectives on what that's like. But the more you get into it, the more you realise what you don't know, which yeah. is... Which is amazing. Um, to me, the the special part about the Antarctic, going off of what you're saying, is it's always been a place which people go to and then come back from. Um, it's the only continent that doesn't have a native human population, and I think we can all agree if we were to, to cut off supply to Antarctic field stations, it w- people there wouldn't last very long. It's not necessarily sustainable to have um, the current human presence there without helping them from the outside. So it's it's a place you can go to but then come back from, and that kind of frontier aspect of it is very, very appealing as well. The and only other place that I can sort of see that would be similar is, is going to space. Yeah, and, and, and the Antarctic and, and space comparisons are many. There's so many, right? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but that's that whole thing where it's like, okay, and yet one day down the track that might change, and yes, we might all be you know on rockets and travelling who knows where, but for now and for all of the future, all the past generations of, of humans that have walked on the Earth, yeah. That's that's you know we've always looked to the stars and and in that same way it's kind of like okay the the f- very few few people that get to go and experience that mm-hmm. um, Antarctica is is like that in a, in, in another way. Uh, the other thing I'd say uh, talking about wildlife and history and politics and the the landscape. We say Antarctic science. We don't say Australian science. We don't say North American science. We don't say European science. It's, to me, a a field in which you can learn so much, not just about biology or geology by itself. When you say Antarctic science, that's um, a lot of the different disciplines of science kind of wrapped into one. And so if you are a quote-unquote Antarctic scientist, Um, To me, you've got the opportunity to learn not just about um, whatever it is you are specialising in, say it's geology, um, but you do have, I'd say, more opportunity than most to learn uh, from more of the different disciplines uh, than if you were just um, studying uh, somewhere, say, in North America. We say that quite often at Scott Base with many scientists in the summer that all come down and they're doing the individual little pieces of research, but you might have a biologist who's studying moss and lichen, for example, and then they might sit next to a different biologist who's studying little microbes on Mount Erebus in a volcanic environment. And they'll chat to each other and they'll be like, oh, actually, we've got some similarities here. Maybe we can team up, establish a research project where we can work together. And collectively you're taking knowledge from two different areas combining them and then you're just you're progressing the understanding of of the whole place which is pretty special and then that ties into oh okay so you've got these little microbes what about these other little microbes or what about these other little am- animals krill for example phytoplankton or whatever that live in the ocean that then contributes to someone else's yep. research project yep. and someone else knows something different about maybe the penguins that eat the krill and it's just yeah there's so many links to be made it's just a massive web of knowledge and understanding which is why it's so important but it's also that international collaboration right like the number of scientists that come from all over the different countries and okay right you might not even be associated with a certain country but you can still as a scientist go through a certain area because you need to study in a certain location that this station has access to or stuff like that so it's kind of that whole the continent without borders um, is is phenomenal, right? And you think we're, um, you know, you, there's a whole lot of tension in the world and there's a whole lot of things going on. Um, to, to have that kind of collaborative space um, in, in, in our, you know, on our own planet, um, it's, it really is a beautiful, beautiful thing from that side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the continent that is not owned by any one country um, and is shared um, and has remained that way for. 50 odd plus years now um, the only continent there's never been a war um, it really is an, an amazing place for that and to to have it set aside specifically for scientific research and for peaceful intentions um, yeah really really special that we've managed to do it and keep it up so far absolutely okay so s- skipping back to 2014 yes did, did you get to see your leopard seal I didn't get to see a leopard seal in no, 2014 no <laughs> I saw my first ever leopard seal uh, last year here in Christchurch 
Uh, I managed to see three of them. Uh, so I'm part of a group that monitors leopard seals that um, every now and again, particularly during the late winter into the spring periods, will have some a small number of individuals that will uh, migrate north and kind of scatter themselves amongst different beaches, particularly on the New Zealand South Island. And whenever a a uh, member of the public sees one, um, take a photo, send it in, report it, and that's when, uh, if one of us is free, one of the volunteers will go out, photograph it, and see if it's one of these individuals that we've seen before. They've each got a unique spot patterning, so just like a, an actual leopard or um, like your fingerprints, each, the pattern is different to each individual. So we'll go out there, photograph them, see if it's a uh, the same individual as one we've marked before so that's when i got to see my first one three of them but uh that took quite some time after 2014. um in 2014 itself though going uh down to the antarctic to the antarctic peninsula uh crossing as many people talk about the drag passage which is not exactly fun but definitely worthwhile um staring out my little uh, bunk room window this little circular window and just seeing the first iceberg roll on past and maybe an hour or so later still just staring out that window seeing the first penguins uh, Adelie penguins porpoising through the water um, and spent four or five days total just around the Antarctic Peninsula area itself doing very very typical things for that kind of expedition whale watching zodiac cruising hiking in the snow digging a snow trench and sleeping on the continent waking up in the morning from that and there's humpback whales off in the distance just breaching and blowing so that's that's an experience which was um something that uh to a very very young person a teenager at the time was uh really quite changing and yeah uh, even to people that are much older um that go down there and can't quite describe it um, talk to many people that have gone down there to work like yourselves but also gone down on tourist expeditions they'll, they'll describe something pretty pretty similar yeah so you say you're in high school when you went to Antarctica was that a like a family holiday or was it a like a grant or a scholarship or something that you won was it through the school how did that come about how did that come about uh, so the school that I was a part of um, essentially arranged this trip um, and it's the reason I say I've been very fortunate and very lucky um, all this time is because um, my family was able to to pay for that. So it was just me going down. So uh, me and um, a few other boys my age and got to go down and, and be a part of that. So that was something that was um, arranged through my school and, you know, no birthday presents for quite some time, <laughs> <laughs> but um, not something I would trade for, for anything. That is an incredible education opportunity. Yeah not something I'd trade for anything. Uh, and it's it's great when I see some other efforts and initiatives which are out there which are trying to give um, people that same kind of experience to show them this place and, and why we should care about it. Um, different ones in the, the UK and uh, here, in, here in New Zealand as well, um, which is great to see, just trying to show people this amazing bottom of the world. Yeah, it's great to see that um, there are some university, University of Canterbury running some Antarctic um, study programs, which is great to get young people involved because we need that next generation to come through and continue the science that past generations have started, you know, yep. continuing those long-term data sets and keeping up with the information that's coming through and that research. So I think it, it's so important to get kids interested in this and is partly the reason why Johnny and I have started this because we want parents to listen to this in their car with their kids in the back yeah. and the kids go, oh, that's actually really cool. I didn't know about leopard seals. Let's go and do some research in that. And you never know where that might lead. Yeah. So inspiring that next generation for us is a huge driver and something that we value. And it's, yeah, it's something that's it's so important, right? And particularly um, getting, uh, getting people to to care about this place that so often they can't visit and, and can't see. And we describe it as this place that is very special because you might not be able to go there again. And it becomes quite challenging to um, to talk about how amazing it is uh, when it is so difficult to, to go down. But to those of us that have been lucky enough to have gone down and seen it, 
um, yeah, it kind of does fall upon us to talk about um, why we should care about it. For sure. I'm interested in just jumping back to the leopard seal chat in Christchurch. These vagrants, it's not unusual for them to visit New Zealand. That While they are Antarctic seals, they do travel quite long distances and they are quite regularly, well, I say regularly, but they are seen in New Zealand and it's yeah. not just a super one-off random vagrant around the place. So how common is it? That is something I would uh, love to be able to tell you with some more detail. Um, there's uh, a number of students that I know that are currently working with data to try to answer those very questions. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of issues if you're trying to get something like a, a population estimate um, for these animals. Uh, they're just really not regularly seen enough to be able to calculate how many are coming up that we see are there more that we just aren't seeing um so for example i saw uh, three myself um last year of other sightings that i'm aware of i know there was at least two others um, that came up during that season and plenty plenty more that i'm sure i wasn't uh wasn't told about so christchurch and dunedin uh kind of hot spot areas uh, for around the south island but one of the animals that I saw last year was uh, made his way all the way up to Wellington um, before coming back down and I saw him as he was making his way south um, from Wellington to Christchurch down to the Antarctic again so uh, that was really cool because that was a confirmed yep we know this animal was here we know he then made his way south how many are here if they're here all year round um, we know one very famous individual was hanging around Auckland for a very, very long time. Um, her name was Ofa, and uh, more details about you know if they're coming up regularly. I just don't have that uh, at the moment, just because they are very difficult animals to study, which is one of the interesting parts about them. You made mention earlier around um, the the females being larger than mm. the males. What typically is the size and the kind of weights and stuff like that? Uh, so good size female 600 kilo um, males I don't have that number off the top of my head but easily could be getting to 400 plus kilograms and that's a, a good healthy fat um, <laughs> we, yeah, fat is a benefit when you are living in <laughs> below freezing um, seawater um, just purely for blubber and insulation um, and just eating a lot of very fatty uh, energy dense foods like penguins and like other seals um, so yeah they can get up to some crazy crazy kilos they're nothing compared to adult male southern elephant seals which get up to four four and a half ton but they're still pretty pretty decently sized animals and the lengths male could be getting about three meters three ma- female above that so they're decently sized animals yeah. and definitely worthy of apex predator Uh, the largest male that I've ever seen was uh, probably about two and a half meters long and that was uh, the one the ones here in Christchurch so somewhat juvenile somewhat juvenile um, but the the teeth that he had were um, were quite worn down so it was quite very yellowy blunted stunted uh, teeth so he's probably quite old but just not necessarily the largest animal okay so where do leopard seals hang out typically when they're in the Antarctic are they pack ice Seals? Are they land? Are they where? Where are they going? Yeah, um, I would classify them as as a pack ice seal. So pack ice, the very broken up um, sea ice, uh, which surrounds Antarctica. Um, probably what most people think of when they think of broken up sea ice, little thin chunks which seals can haul out on or just climb out on and rest. And in amongst there is essentially their food. It's penguins um, and other seals so leopard seals are the only seal that will actively go out and hunt other warm blooded uh, seals like crybeta seal pups uh, antarctic fur seal pups antarctic fur seals these are all game for a hungry leopard seal Um, if you have a look at uh, adult crybeta seals there's quite a lot of nasty scars that they'll have uh, covering their bodies and Almost certainly that's due to that seal being attacked but escaping a, a leopard seal when it was a pup. Lucky one that got away. Yeah. So, 
you ever see scarred up crab eaters, you probably know what caused it. Um, leopard seals um, don't necessarily go as far south as um, some of the other seals, like around Scott Base. You've got a lot of Weddell seals, which are hauling out uh, onto the ice. Those are the seals that are breathing um, as far south as possible. I believe they're the mammal that breeds the furthest south out of Correct. any mammal on the planet. So yeah. you're not necessarily going to find leopard seals um, that far south very commonly. Um, so breeding uh, for leopard seals is something which is very unknown at the moment. Um, births itself have very, very rarely been witnessed and there's only a handful of uh, pups that have ever been seen. But uh, hauling out onto the ice and kind of digging a little hole, little crevasse, little um, tucked away point uh, for the mother to give birth. Pup will lay on there and then the mother is going away, feeding, coming back um, to the pup and just nursing and suckling with that pup. And after a few weeks, mum goes away, pup's got to figure out life on its own. And similar story to uh, quite a few penguins as well. After a relatively short time with your parents, figure it out we got our own things to do. So yeah. it's not exactly the uh, comfiest introduction to a very hard life. Yeah. Have you seen one? Uh, no, I don't think I have, yeah. actually. Yeah. I don't think I've seen one at Scott Base either. Mm. No, definitely not. A little bit further me. south. I have heard of them at Cape Evans, around the hut up there, but, yeah, not as far south as Scott Base. There was, uh, when I was reading Shackleton's account of his uh, Nimrod expedition, he uh, talked mm. about seeing one at Cape Royds on Ross Island. Yeah. And he... Uh, describe the process of going down and trying the biologists um, going down with revolvers and trying to shoot the thing because that's how um, biological samples were gathered back in the day you sh you shot it and then you preserved it and then you pr brought it back and they described shooting it five times uh, with a revolver to before it finally went down but they've we know that they are around Ross Island at least have been in the past um, again, back from those early times, there was descriptions of the weird internal anatomy that they found. They were confused by it for some reason. They thought that this animal had two hearts. Now, I've talked with quite a few people that have looked at a lot of leopard seal innards and no one has ever described seeing two hearts. So I don't quite know what that was on about, but we know that they have been um, down at uh, those kind of latitudes before but I wouldn't expect to see them too commonly. They're more commonly found a little bit further north. Yeah. They've got quite interesting teeth as well, don't they? So they've got teeth that allows them to eat your penguins, your other seals and things like that, but they've also got teeth that allow them to filter for krill and, and other things like that. So, Yeah. So the their canines are very typical of many other um, carnivorous animals, predators, big cats. Um, but their weird teeth, they're almost molar, uh, where our molars would be, they've got, I believe they're called tricorn teeth. And if you imagine, uh, it's almost like they've got three heads. They've got two little heads, uh, which on the left hand, right hand side at the base of the tooth, and then they've got a single um, spoke, a single head that sticks up above, and it kind of makes like a little triangle, um, and there's little gaps in between, kind of making a weird, almost crown-like shape. And those, when they fit together, when they open up their mouth, let in a large amount of seawater, clamp their mouth shut, um, that water that they've engulfed can then escape from those teeth, but then the krill that they've captured inside will stay inside. So we, when you talk about whales, I think a lot of people are familiar with the idea of a baleen whale before yep. and opening up their mouths, clamping them shut, water goes out through the baleen, the krill and the fish that they swallowed stays inside. It's the same process. Yep. And um, the crab eater seals, most terribly named seal on the planet, um, <laughs> which leopard seals love to eat, they are krill specialists. So if you look at crab eater seal teeth, it's exactly the same. It's very, very similar uh, to these leopard seal teeth that they have as well. Weddell seals, Ross seals, they've also got similar shaped teeth. Again, it's all just due to what they eat. And what yeah. they so Weddell seals, we talk a lot about you know, them using their teeth to keep breathing holes open and things like that. And in some cases, that actually being what causes their death because mm -hmm. they've worn their teeth down so far that they can no longer go out and hunt fish and eat and they die from starvation. 
Is that something that leopard seals do as well? Do you think they keep those breathing holes open or is it by the nature of them living in the pack ice they don't really need to because the ice is shifting itself around and there's always access to, to air for them to breathe? To my knowledge, um, a leopard seal shouldn't uh, too often be going far enough south to get into the fast ice, so um, where the wet L seals are living and breeding, where the ice is much more permanent and you do need to start carving in breathing holes for yourself. Uh, I'm not aware of too many leopard seals going that far south to yep. need to carve breathing holes for themselves, um, but tooth wear and tooth decay um, is definitely a potential uh, cause of death if you're no longer able to hunt the kind of um, prey that you need to keep up with your bon body's uh, energy needs, uh, yeah, that could also be a potential cause of death. Yeah. It's quite common for a lot of different species of animals, tooth wear and tooth decay. Elephants get something like it's either five or six sets of um, molars in their life, rear teeth, and as soon as you wear down that last set, then the clock starts ticking until um, uh, starvation, essentially. Yeah, right crazy um through your work at the international antarctic center you must come across a few interesting people and must tell some obviously super engaging and, and interesting stories what what's a day in the life like as a, as a tourist guide at the international antarctic center in christchurch uh every day is different and every day is quite interesting so uh Depending on the day, we could have um, one, two, I think uh, the record I've ever seen was uh, 10 different uh, tourist groups uh, rocking into the International Antarctic Centre. So this could be anything from a school which is looking to have a, a day off, coming inside and let uh, the kids have um, a few hours uh, at the Antarctic Centre, have some fun. We've got uh, some Hagland vehicles, which I know you two will be very familiar with. Um, that go uh, behind the building. We've got an obstacle course which the vehicles will go over, simulating a bit of uh, off-terrain driving, a bit of hills, slants and some other things. Uh, we've got a, a storm room, a cold room, which goes all the way down to minus 18 Celsius, which is not necessarily the coldest that it can go to in Antarctica, but it's cold enough that most people kind of get the idea all of the canadians that go inside they always come out saying well it's not that cold <laughs> cool mate just going in the t-shirt yeah um we'll see um and we've got some uh, some local new zealand penguins some little penguins so my my job is to take whatever group uh that might be coming in and kind of show them around um inside the attraction and basically try to do a, a miniature version of what we're doing here at the moment yep. which is talking about Antarctica and uh, the reason that it's important and that it's very special to, to those of us that have gone down. So uh, one group up to 10 groups and different groups um, having different needs, of course, and just show them on through. And as we're going through, I typically like to start off every tour just by saying the same thing, which is if they don't, if no one remembers anything else other than these three things, I'll be happy. Um, the first two are very easy. First one is how many polar bears are in Antarctica? <laughs> None. Although you will be surprised about what, how many people go. Oh yeah, that's right. They're only up in the north. Next one is how many penguins are in the Arctic? None. <laughs> Final one is what's the difference between Antarctica and the South Pole? And that one stumps up quite a few people. Um, quite a few people will know, but most will just say they're the, the, the same thing, right? They're, they're the same thing. And uh, to those of you listening, Antarctica is the continent, and the South Pole just means the southernmost point on the planet. Um, when you're standing on the South Pole, everywhere is north, which is quite the head-scratchy thing. And then standing on the North Pole, everywhere is south. So the reason I have that one in as my final please just remember this um, as part of my job I do get to speak to a lot of people that have gone and lived and worked at the South Pole and they always have some some great stories um, that I love to get from them but I also speak to a lot of people that have gone to Antarctica like I did on a tourist expedition and sometimes they'll say they've been to the South Pole and I'm sure you can imagine my disappointment when I find out the truth yeah it's quite an important distinction that as well so, yeah yeah um, so that's uh, typically how I'll start things off. 
um, and then we'll go off and um, sh- kind of showcase uh, what the vehicles are like to go on, how pleasant or sometimes unpleasant <laughs> they are to be riding in and uh, just tell people, keep in mind, you could be in the back of one of these things for uh, up to 18 days is one of the field lengths, uh, the uh, the trip lengths uh, to go from one of the Chinese bases on the coast uh, to inland is 18 days in the back of a Hagland, uh, which is quite the extraordinary thing when you also have to consider getting off, setting up your tent each night, making food, going to sleep, coming, waking up again, packing down the tent, putting in the vehicles and setting off again. And that's a, a much, much cushier, easier version of Antarctic land exploration uh, than was done in the past, but still not necessarily the easiest thing. Absolutely. Yeah, 18 days is a, that's a long slog. I think my longest haggling trip might have been eight hours to Cape Royds and then you get off and you do your thing and then you another four hours to get back to Scott Base. So, yeah, I can't imagine doing that for days and days and weeks and weeks on end. When they first started out doing the um, traverses for the Kiwi crew out into the middle of the Ross Ice Shelf, um, the first first one of that they did, um, they had a couple of piston bullies and then the support vehicle was actually a Haglin. Yeah. And um, that was pretty pretty rough and, and the reason for that is that um, while a lot of people probably think that Antarctica is all completely flat, um, the issue is, is uh, when, when uh, storms and stuff like that blow, um, the snow doesn't necessarily all just sit flat uh, it all ends up building up into these um, yeah, these uh, lines of, of different snow and, and forming these uh, windrows and so when you're actually going up and over them you can't get a good amount of speed up and consistently you're, you're, you're slowly hitting them and, and usually because the crust is so um, solid on the top due to all of the the wind and, and, the, and the temperature changes. Um, it means that it's not a soft, um, snowy kind of experience. It's a it's a very hard hard thing that you hit. So while everyone thinks, oh yes, yeah, sweet, you're just driving along, it's like no 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 no. You're going up and down and and you're constantly hitting these things. And so you're travelling at a speed so that you're minimising the amount of jarring ultimately um, because that's the thing that'll uh, yeah, wind you up the most. <laughs> Yeah. Especially if you've got a bit of a cavalier driver, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it wakes up all the people in the back pretty quick, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. I like sitting in the back because I get to, well, if there's not too many people there, I just get to kick out and doze off to sleep and the trip goes pretty quickly. But if you're sitting in the back with, say, 10 people in there, it's pretty rugged. Yeah, and especially for eight hours, I, I couldn't imagine that. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's that's one of the things which we'll do uh, we'll come to the snow room talk about the different temperatures that are going on down in Antarctica um, one of the questions that I get very commonly which frustrates me quite a lot is what's the temperature in Antarctica and my response is what's the temperature in Australia what's the temperature in North America what's the temperature in Asia where are you what season is it are you high up are you low down it, it all just depends um, so we'll run through quickly some of the different um, field stations in Antarctica and we'll go through the different weather which is down there for that day. So we've got access to some weather data for some of those stations. Cool. It's a continent nearly twice the size of Australia. Yeah. It's absolutely massive. And we could have a look at a British station which is on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is quite far north, warmest area in Antarctica. Uh, last week it was zero degrees zero degrees at nine o'clock and on that same day at a russian station uh, in a very very cold high point in antarctica uh, it was about minus 57 yeah so that's the kind of range which you're looking at yeah um so again what's the temperature it depends it can be very very cold um, or it can be still mostly cold i think for most of us living in australia or new zealand but it's not so bad yeah That's something that comes up on my social media quite a lot is I'll put up a a video or a picture or something of the temperature and say, hey, it was minus 20 Celsius outside today. And people will say, oh, it's colder in Canada at the moment, but it'll be winter in Canada and it's summer in Antarctica. Yes. So, yes, okay, it's colder, but is it a fair comparison, yes or no? Yeah, and hear a lot of people from the Northern Hemisphere say, oh, it's just like walking to work in the winter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, this is summer. Just just keep that in mind. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, have have quite a lot of good fun with that. 
Um, we can have a look at uh, some of the different uh, stations uh, that are down in Antarctica, so Scott Base, McMoto Station. Uh, as I'm sure you do know, there's some webcams which are set up yep. which uh, can spy on some of the people <laughs> down at the base down there. Yeah. So we'll just quickly have, um, have a look through those and see anything interesting that's going on. Uh, my favorite cameras to look at are always the ones at the American station at the South Pole. Uh, particularly if we manage to see people that are down there when it's uh, about nine o'clock when we get the weather updates because I've seen people walking outside in the South Pole and it's minus 80 plus degrees Celsius. So minus 88, nearly minus 90 wind chill and people are walking outside. Yeah. And the first time I saw that, I thought, what in the hell are you doing out there? Um, and it was uh, shortly afterwards that I learned, unlike McMurdo and Scott Base, where there's these three uh, weather conditions, condition three, condition two, condition one, um, I believe at the South Pole there is no such thing. Pretty much condition one all the time, time. on temperature. Yeah. Yep. So if, you, uh, if your policies don't let you work outside in certain temperatures, then you're never going to get any work done, and that's just the nature of the South Pole. Crazy, yeah. That's nuts. The the webcam's a pretty interesting one. I don't know if it was the same as when you were down south, Johnny, but we always find that people will put up happy birthday messages to friends and family and yep. Merry Christmas and all those sorts of things and then send a link to their family member or friends back home and say, go and look at the webcam it's got base and it'll say happy birthday, Jimmy, or something on there. And Yeah, just a cool little way to let people know that you're thinking about them. Yep. Uh, I think my favourite one that I saw was, uh, I think, I forget which rugby match it was, but uh, the Waratahs won. And the following day, we just saw a little sign saying, up the Waz. <laughs> that may have been people involved in my winter. Yeah. Yeah, put that in there. Yeah, 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 some very avid rugby fans that were, <laughs> were pretty proud about that. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's part of my entertainment for the day is yeah. having a look at what's going on down there. Mm. So that's always fun when people put up little things like that. Love it. Um, the seals are from one of the webcams that we have for Scott Base. Um, the wet L seals hoard out on the ice. We can just see all these little tiny black dots. I think the most I counted in one day was over 60. Um, just all hoard out on the ice, chilling there. So yeah. that's also really cool to see. Yeah. Um, besides that, um, we'll have a chat about some of the penguins that um, we've got. So penguins are quite interesting to me because a lot of people associate them fairly with Antarctica, but there's so many different species of penguins and they're not restricted to Antarctica. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the Galapagos Islands earlier. There's penguins at the Galapagos Islands, yeah. um, which I find extraordinary. Um, so, no polar bears and penguins mixing, but penguins basically everywhere in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. Um, Australia, New Zealand, South America, South Africa, Galapagos Islands, Sub-Antarctic Islands. Um, and they're really, really funny, interesting animals just because they are birds that spend so much of their time in the water. A bird, if it doesn't swim, it will starve. It sounds quite strange, but yeah. they are fascinating animals. Yeah. Um, and the probably the icon, like the polar bear is of the Arctic and the Northern Hemisphere. Um, I'd argue the, the emperor penguin um, is probably the icon of the Antarctic. Yeah, yeah. You, you spoke earlier on about uh, a little story involving Shackleton's crew mm. on the Nimrod expedition out at Cape Royds. I imagine you probably have to speak to people about the history of Antarctica quite a bit. I imagine there's a few questions that pop up about that. So how does that go down and how do you respond to some of these wide-ranging questions? Antarctic history is a very, long, a very, very long, very ex extensive topic. Um, a lot of the questions which I will get, which uh, will probably be people asking about the more famous explorers Amundsen, Scott, Shackleton um, questions will be how, where, where did Shackleton go down how long were they down there, how did they survive, um, what kind of gear were they wearing, wasn't this person stupid for doing this when they should have done that um, easy in hindsight very very easy in hindsight um, the my fascination with Antarctic history kind of goes back a little bit towards that intervening period between 2014 and now, uh, back to Australia, had this experience in Antarctica and trying to describe it, trying to put words to it, and 
coming up empty-handed every single time and I start working with a bloke who is very interested in explorers and history in general and that's when I start going back over Antarctic history and finding these guys, these early explorers, writing in their diaries this same feeling, this same draw back to Antarctica. And that that really stuck with me because I could read these tales and kind of have someone to talk to, have some know that someone else understood this feeling, uh, even though I couldn't quite talk to them about it. I knew that they had felt it. And these are people that went back to Antarctica again and again and again. And remembering back in those days, early uh, 20th century and beforehand, every time you go down, you're rolling the dice with death. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people um, were lost during those early days, but people kept going back because it was such a extraordinary opportunity and an extraordinary place to go and see. Yeah. So, so um, some of the, the questions that I get and, and answer, um, who was who was the best explorer, who, uh, who got the <laughs> furthest, um, <laughs> personal favorites, things like that. Um, I've got uh, some personal favorite, I'd probably have to say, overall, I'm a Shackleton fan, just because he was kind of the, the person that really got me interested in Antarctic history in general, and the story of the Endurance Expedition, probably the most famous one of the most famous polar survival stories out there that a lot of people probably know um, is so compelling. Uh, But since reading that story and going and exploring more, there's loads more stories um, that are out there that are um, maybe not as well known as endurance, but I definitely think show some of the exact same things that endurance shows when it comes to what people are capable of living through. Um, and that's another great draw card, I think, of telling these stories about this time as you just learn how resilient people really are. Yeah, we've spoken about this before, but I've often reflected on this personally, thinking that if I were back on one of those expeditions in the early 1900s, late 1800s, I don't know if I could have done it. But yeah. I just, I don't know. I, I just have this feeling that I would be one of those people that just gets left behind and just wouldn't make it. But it blows my mind what they went through having stood in some of those huts and looked at the clothing that they wore and being able to see the tins of food that they were eating and the rations that they had and how cold the buildings were and all of the hardship and the stories. And it's so different to what life is like these days. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about um, travelling in Haglands, you know, covering, you know, you can even, even in a Hagland going, you know, 20 k's an hour, maybe 13 k's an hour, you can still travel travel some ground over an eight-hour period, right? But these guys were, were struggling to pull two miles in a day because um, they had all these sleds full of full of gear and, and often laying caches for, for the return leg. Like, it's just, it's phenomenal when you think about it. It's yeah. just such a harsh, harsh environment. Even just getting to Antarctica in the first place, right? Like, that was weeks and weeks on a wooden ship yeah. in some pretty rugged ocean, and now we can fly there in five hours. Yeah. Um, One of my uh, much more recent finds when it comes to Antarctic exploration is a guy by the name of Herbert Wilkins, um, Australian guy, um, pilot, navigator, did a whole bunch of exploration up in the Arctic and was the first person to successfully fly a plane in the Antarctic. And he was describing um, on that one of those first flights them covering over 2,000 kilometres and him sitting in the back seat uh, with his little map sketching out uh, the land that he's seeing. He describes like the progress just being so quick that by the time he's sketched out a very, very basic map, the scenery's changed again. Like, oh, crap, get the new one down there. And he compares that to uh, previous seasons when he was down there of weeks and weeks and weeks for something like 60 kilometres, 40, 60 kilometres. So the exponential improvement in the speed at which we can travel the Antarctic um, in just a very, very short number of years. Amundsen getting there in 1911 and then by you know, sometime in the late 20s um, uh, Admiral Byrd gets to the South Pole in a, in a plane as well. So it 
in something like 15 hours, 15 hours, 50 minutes, as opposed to weeks and weeks and weeks out there on the ice, That's on the crazy. ground with dogs and sledges. And you, know, you mentioned the, the progress of these guys sometimes being two miles a day. Another one of my favorite stories is uh, Sir Douglas Mawson and his solo survival story. And there's days when he was walking one and a half kilometers in a whole day, just walking one and a half kilometers um, just to get get yourself back. So again, just quite inspirational to think of what you can do when yeah. you really need to. Yeah. You touched on dogs there and they were pretty important in the early days of exploration up until the 1990s, I think, in Antarctica. Uh, it's cool to see that the Antarctic Centre has got a little a nod to that history with the Huskies that come in yep. and, you know, get to talk about those and learn about the impact that dogs had on Antarctic exploration and, you know, Amundsen wouldn't have got to the pole without dogs and, you know, Scott and some of the subsequent expeditions would have also struggled to do what they tried to achieve without the, the help of dogs. So, yeah, pretty cool that you guys have huskies there for people to go and have a look at. Yeah, and um, Joe, the husky handler there, he does an amazing job at describing that history and the reason that dogs really were important. And it's kind of a reflection on the importance of animals um, being used by humans in the Antarctic in general. Um, ponies, um, although a slightly more than slightly questionable idea to take down to the Antarctic, um, they nevertheless helped Scott and Shackleton when they were down there. Um, Bird took dairy cows down to the Antarctic. Um, and so animals being brought down by people to help them out in various ways is something which has been done uh, quite a number of times. Dogs, when it comes to transversing snow and ice, they've got a lot of advantages um, compared to ponies. Um, dogs, you can feed meat to. Um, so there was a unfortunately very brutal practice of when you are Amundsen, for example, traveling down, trying to get to the South Pole as you are getting further and further south and dogs becoming weaker and weaker. Um, the practice was to sacrifice um, the weakest dogs to feed them to the strongest and that would both give those remaining dogs a bit of strength and help you get um, to the South Pole. You can't feed ponies to other ponies and that was actually a conversation I had to have with one lady um, that it's really not that great of an idea to um, try to feed ponies other ponies. Um, dogs are much lighter, they uh, can uh, go on a much more dense, calorie dense source of food um, there was a food used back in the day and still sometimes used today called pemmican, which is just um, meat, which has had all the moisture sucked right out of it and then ground up into this tiny little powder and then you soak it in fat. And you're basically just trying to make a very light, very dense bar of meat and fat and that's going to give you protein and energy um, to keep on going. So you, you can feed them these much lighter more compact sources of energy and they can go a lot easier ponies you're taking straw and hay and it takes up a lot of space and if a lot of the the carrying capacity of your ponies is taken up and used by just carrying their own food then you're losing a lot of the benefit of taking that animal down in the first place yeah. you want to be able to take animals to carry and help you with your stuff and not necessarily just with their own food yeah um there's also one story which I'll just mention uh, as people are uh, with Shackleton's expedition, with the Nimrod expedition, getting their animals off the ship and offloading them. Um, around about that time, one of the ponies actually falls into um, the ocean, falls into um, the very, very cold Southern Ocean, and they immediately get the pony out, shake it off, are trying to dry it, and in an attempt to try to warm the pony up, someone actually shoves a bottle of brandy down its throat. <laughs> and I just couldn't help but smile when I read that story, um, thinking about how many different um, violations that would be under today. Mm -hmm. But back in that day, just, hey, if we're cold, drink alcohol, warms you up. Yeah. If pony's cold, we need to warm it up, shove some alcohol <laughs> down there. But it was, um, yeah, just telling of... Um, people in that time doing doing what they did. 
and you're speaking about how hard it was to go down to Antarctica at all, um, crossing the Southern Ocean. Uh, when Shackleton went down on Nimrod, the ship was so damn heavy with all the stuff that they were carrying, they couldn't go down under their own power and still have enough coal left over to burn for heat for the huts over winter. So they get a, a piggyback off a tugboat, which essentially drags them halfway to Antarctica <laughs> um, off of this single steel cable. And so imagining going across the Southern Ocean with these massive waves that very easily make you seasick um, essentially just being a trailer uh, to another boat which is pulling you along um, it's really quite extraordinary yeah that's a nuts story that yeah um, so yeah that's the very very brief um, overview or just some of the things that are that are going on down there people are mostly just asking uh, where where did these different explorers go when did they go who explored what who got where first um, and they're all they're all very easy questions yeah. which it's quite easy to point out when you've got a map of Antarctica right behind you yeah yeah you got a very well-rounded knowledge of lots of things which is pretty cool I've got some very niche knowledge about some small topics and I think Johnny's probably the same but again this is another reason why we're doing this because we want to expand our knowledge and learn some different things and you've told us some very cool stories today that yeah we'll I'm definitely going to take away and go and do some more investigating so yeah I think we might wrap it up there because we're getting close to close to time but Louis Chilcott guide at the International Antarctic Centre thank you so much for donating your time to us today and coming to have a chat about Antarctica yeah, really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, yeah well, the same as Matty, I've, I've learned a whole lot. So um, it's been really, really good to get you on and, and see your passion. And uh, yeah, I, I've, um, I think it's such an asset to see, um, you know, people like you uh, sharing Antarctica, um, particularly in, in the place you work, right? And, and that, that you get to do that on a daily basis is so cool. So um, yeah, thanks very much for your, for your time and uh, coming and having a chat with us. Yeah, pleasure. And um, the one thing I'll say about uh, the great thing about what you two are doing is sometimes I feel the Antarctic community here in New Zealand, maybe more broadly, is very, very good at talking to itself. Um, but trying to actually get that knowledge out to the wider public seems to be a bit more of a challenge. So through things like this, um, the International Antarctic Centre, just giving people, everyday people, the general public, the chance to interact and learn about what's going on down there is very, very important. Yeah, thank you. We'll definitely get you back at some point. It would be great to expand on some of those stories and who knows, talk about some future en endeavours and future expeditions and adventures that you go on and hopefully you see some more leopard seals in the Very much hope so. in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for those who don't know, the International Antarctic Centre is out by the airport in Christchurch. It's open every day? Uh, open every day. It's open every day. And it is a very cool resource for people who want to learn a bit more about Antarctica. It's a great kid-friendly place and super knowledgeable, super friendly, super cool guides. So go and have a look at it and check it out. It's a great way to spend a rainy day. Indeed. Right. Cheers. Awesome. That's it for today's episode of the Everything Antarctica podcast. Thanks for listening. If you want to find out more about us as hosts, you can find us on Instagram at Maddie K. Jordan and at Johnny Harrison NZ. We're also on socials. You can find us at Everything Antarctica. This episode will be released on all streaming platforms and the long form video will be found on YouTube. Check us out wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five star rating. This will really help us in our mission to make this podcast as good as it possibly can be. Please share this episode with your friends and social networks so we can spread the word to more people. Until next time, stay cool.